like to thank you, the organizers, uh, for allowing me, giving me the opportunity of addressing uh, in front of, front of you the topic of uh, measurements of black hole spins in AGM. My name is Matteo Guainazzi. I work for the European Space Agency, and I'm currently in the Science Operations Center of the Astro Age mission. The Astro Age mission is uh, the next uh, high energy X ray. Uh, satellite which will be launched by the Japanese Space Agency and you may ask why a European person is working for the Japanese mission but this will be unveiled only at the end of my talk. Uh, let me directly go to the uh, main substance, observational substance of my talk. Uh, what I show here is a compilation of uh, recent compilation of measurements of black hole spin in active galactic nuclei. It's a recent compilation from last year and includes essentially all the reliable measurements that have been done so far, with some exceptions. Uh, this uh, plot shows uh, the black hole spin uh, as a function of, uh, yeah. the black hole spin on the y-axis as a function of the black hole mass, which in AGN can be determined independently through different methods, in the optimal way through uh, optical reverberation methods measurements. Now there are lots of interesting things in this plot that one can uh, immediately see. Of course the statistics is not high, this is a number of 20 measurements more or less, so we can't really do any serious uh, statistical analysis on this data. But there are some indication of some trends. First of all uh, it's uh, obvious that uh, there is in this moment no measurement uh, which is consistent with the Schwarzschild they call solution with an exception of a single data point with huge error bars. So it seems uh, that, observationally speaking, black hole spin in IGN they prefer spin rapidly, and uh, in most cases, actually, maximally spinning, so maximally rapid. Uh, and then there seems to be a trend whereby AGN with lower black hole masses prefer maximally spinning black holes. AGN with higher black hole masses prefer black hole values which are around the 0 0.6 and the 0 0.7. So there seems to be a sort of two magic numbers in nature, one is 0 0.998, one is 0 0.69, as far as black hole spin in AGN are concerned. Now, let me remind you how we measure black hole spin in AGN, and this is probably a totally superfluous transparency in this concept, concept, but it's useful to me to address what's the main meat of my talk is, so which are the systematic uncertainties associated to these measurements. What we observationally measure, what we observationally measure in, uh, in order to determine the spin of a black hole, are X-ray spectra of AGN. And what we measure are, in principle, the distortion on the intrinsic X-ray spectrum, derived uh, by uh, the fact that these spectra are emitted very close to the black hole, so there is a series of <coughs> relativistic, well, dynamical and relativistic, general relativity and special relativity effects, which distort the shape of the observed spectrum. And actually, the best, uh, uh, like the best uh, tool we have available in order to estimate uh, the nature of these relativistic distortion are strong emission lines and most notably the most important line that we use as diagnostic is the fluorescent uh, K-alpha emission line from iron, which is simply the most uh, common and the strongest emission line in X-ray spectrum AGN that we observe. And uh, uh, what we actually measure is uh, the shape of this line, and we associate the shape of this line to the location of the innermost stable orbit of the accretion. And, strong assumption at this point, we assume that the location of the innermost stable orbit of the accretion disk is uniquely determined by general relativity. So, if we have a uh, non-spinning black hole, the location of the innermost stable orbit will be at 6RG, gravitational radii. If we have prograde rotation of the accretion disk uh, with respect to the spin of the black hole, the innermost stable orbit can shrink uh, down to 1.2 something gravitational radii. If we have retrograde rotation, the location of the innermost stable orbit is of the order of 9 RG. Now, I let me stress me that this is a very strong assumption. There are many other reasons for which the innermost stable orbit of the accretion disk could be a different position for other reasons. Uh, truncation, ionization, you know, we could have a disk which 
in the innermost region is so ionized that actually it's completely transparent uh, in emission and absorption to X-rays. So the fact that we measure an innermost stable orbit and we derive from the location of this innermost stable orbit a measure of the spin has behind it a very strong astrophysical assumption. But that's the best we can do. Now, why are we interested in these measurements? Of course, in itself, uh, the fact that we can measure black hole spin is fun, but uh, in itself is just an anecdote, if not for the fact that we believe that the distribution of the black hole spin that we measure in the local universe bears the imprinting of the history of the evolution of the, of the AGN, of the evolution of the galaxy, or the concurrent evolution of the AGN and the galaxy. And this is shown uh, in this uh, distribution. These are distribution extracted from an old, uh, really old uh, paper by Berti and Volontari in 2008, which is the expected distribution of black hole spins in the local universe, uh, depending on the history of the, uh, the history, evolutionary history of the galaxy. So if the accretion on the black hole happened uh, through a series of coherent episodes with uh, comparable uh, angular momentum, we expect uh, a distribution of spin uh, which is highly skewed uh, towards uh, uh, maximally spinning black holes. If uh, we have instead a chaotic history of accretion, so with episode of accretion with chaotic distribution of angular momentum due to subsequent mergers, for instance, or bars uh, which uh, brings material close to the black hole uh, through different paths uh, along the history, evolution history of the galaxy, we expect a distribution of black hole spin uh, skewed towards Schwarzschild black holes, so towards zero spin. And uh, let me stress that this is what we do not observe uh, so far. If we have instead uh, the, uh, the history of the evolution of the galaxy dominated by a single big merger episode, we expect a distribution of the black hole spin centered around 0 0.7, which is, if you remember, the second kind of magical number which the current measurements seem to suggest. So that's the reason why we are interested in the distribution of black speed, because we hope through these measurements to be able to know how galaxies evolve. Now, what I showed in, my, in the first plot are measurements with their statistical error bars, which, as you have seen, are already quite huge. But they are source of systematic uncertainties of these measurements, which are the main topic of my talk today. And they are of three origin, origins. Uh, the first the topic, which is the one on which, as an observer, of course, I feel less confident because they are you know, expert, the experts are sitting in front of, uh, sitting in the audience rather than standing in front of it, are uncertainties on the accretion disk theory. The second kind of uncertainties are related to the broad broadband X-ray modeling, so the way we, the data are, and we treat the data of AGN. And the third point, uh, which is the least uh, interesting and the most uh, trivial, but not the least important, are issued with instrument coverage. So let me go first uh, briefly to the first point. Um, it has been known uh, since several years already that uh, one of the assumptions, even if we accept uh, the idea that uh, through the measurements of the inner stable orbit we can directly derive the value of the black hole spin, there is another very strong assumption in the way we treat the accretion flow which uh, there is behind uh, this uh, simple correlation. And uh, the assumption is that the inner stable orbit is a razor cut, is a, is a sharp transition from accretion to plunging. And there is no intermediate zone contributing to the X-ray emission. Actually, this is a very strong assumption. And uh, it has been verified uh, in a paper by Reynolds and Fabian that indeed the transition between uh, accretion and plunging is uh, Sharp, uh, sharp enough in terms of increase uh, of the ionization parameter and decrease of the, of the density that indeed uh, the region beyond the innermost stable orbit which contributes uh, to the X-ray emission, to the reflection of the accretion disk is uh, small. However, it's not negligible. And this is shown in this plot where on the x-axis they plot the real intrinsic uh, spin of an AGN and on the y-axis the best uh, fit measurement uh, using the, at that point, available uh, uh, reflection model applied on each respect. And the different colors uh, represent uh, different uh, vertical structures of the accretion disk. And you see that for uh, Schwarzschild or moderately spinning black holes, uh, the systematic errors due to our unknown uncertainties 
on the, what happens in the accretion flows uh, close to the innermost stable orbit is rather large. When we go to small to high black hole spins, uh, the uncertainties are uh, smaller, but still out of the order of a factor of a few uh, hundreds in terms of black hole spin measurements. And so this, uh, since we don't know actually what the accretion flow is doing in close to the inner or stable orbit, this is sort of an unavoidable systematic uncertainty on these measurements. Fortunately, for uh, the kind of black hole uh, spins uh, we observe in reality, which is either highly spinning or uh, spinning with this magic value of 0 0.7, the uncertainty is still, this uncertainty is still smaller than the systematic uncertainties of the measurements that we have available. There is a second source of uncertainty related on our models of accretion disk. So the models that we use in this moment to fit the data are simple models with constant density, single ionization parameters, and what typically observers do with the data, they fit the data with at most two components of these uh, constant density models. One that uh, will describe the uh, accretion from the, the reflection from the accretion disk, another one to describe accretion from matter from far from the accretion disk. And it has been shown that this is a, an assumption which is actually can introduce a significant skewing in our results. Very often, what we observe, what the data suggest us, is our very high values of the radial emissivity parameter. One of the parameters with which we describe this uh, accretion disk reflection models is a radial dependency of the emissivity of the disk through a number Q. And very often, this Q value is uh, 4, 5, 6, 7, even 10. Now, if you have a radial emissivity error which decrease with the radius as r to minus 7, this means that if you go from an annulus in the accretion disk at 1 rg, a 1 rg, and an annulus at 2 rg, the latter will contribute to the X-ray emission a factor of 30 lower than the former. So this means that if you measure rq equals 7, you are basically intrinsically saying that the whole emission is coming from rg equal 1, essentially. So uh, if actually this is wrong, so if actually our models are uh, wrong, uh, we can this, we, this can have a very strong impact on our determination of the black hole spin. And in this, Vobod et al. demonstrated that this high value of radial emissivity can be simply a fake result, a fake number, produced by the fact that the intrinsic physics is actually a disk with a lamppost for each lamp with a radially stratified ionization according to what theory tells us that the radial density distribution should be, and this model with the wrong model, a single ionization reflection model with constant density and the typically broken power law we see. So once again, our ignorance of, of our limitation, the current model that observers use to fit the data, can have a strong impact on the way we interpret it. There is another important source with uncertainties, which is related to the broadband modeling of AGN. Now, this is a simplified view of how an X-ray spectrum of the AGN looks like. And without entering into any details, I would like just to stress you the number of colors in this plot, which represents the different astrophysical component that we typically require in order to fit X-ray spectrum. Uh, various kind of reflections, ionized absorption, soft excesses of whose origin is still unknown, maybe related to contonization in the accretion disk or the uh, thermal tail of the, of the disk. Well, you know, it's really difficult actually to fit uh, these data properly if you don't have extremely good statistics and extremely good energy resolution to be able to separate the various components. So what I mean by that is shown in more detail in this plot, where I show models, these are models, it has no data, uh, this is in the green line, this is the, you know, the description, the, you know, what the overall model of an AGN looked like at the typical resolution of an X-ray CCD. And uh, the red line represents the same model uh, at the resolution of the microcalorimeter. The resolution of a CCD is of the order of two tenths. The resolution of a microcalorimeter is uh, the order of hundreds to thousands. And uh, you may recognize uh, here this strong iron line, uh, which is uh, skewed slightly by the relativistic effects. Uh, there are other uh, you know, details in the spectrum which are used observationally to constrain uh, the disk reflection parameters. But what I would like to bring your attention to is that the red 
model contains lots of absorption lines which are related to probably outflows that we measure in AGN and uh, that are due to gas along our line of sight and through which we can actually see the AGN and measure the disk reflection. Now, the point is that as far as uh, the energy range above uh, 2 kV is concerned, we do not have in this moment instruments which are able really to detect separate these lines because the instrument that we use have the resolution of the green line. So these lines are completely washed out. And what you try to do is to reconstruct this very complicated absorption structure through data at very smaller resolution where these, these, in, uh, these absorption structures are not individually measured. In practical terms, these are the data on which the first relativistic broad, relativistically broadened line has been claimed to be discovered. It's a known AGN, a local AGN, a AGN in a local universe, 6.30.15. These were after data taken by the ASCA satellite in the early 90s. And the energy resolution of these data was of the order of 30, a ridiculous resolution compared to any optical spectrum. Now, unfortunately, most of the measurement on which our, uh, uh, the, the, the first plot I show you, the distribution of observed black hole speed in AGN are based, well, this, uh, resolu the data are essentially comparable resolution, even worse resolution than these original data taken in the mid-90s. And uh, if my, the model I showed you in the previous slide is right, this means that in this plot, superposed to these data points, there are lots of small uh, uh, emission line, absorption lines which are completely unresolved. So this uh, decomposition of the spectrum is correct, provided that you have been able to properly account for these very narrow and uh, many absorption lines which are completely invisible in your data. There is another con problem in analyzing X-ray data, uh, is that the very often we use the data with a small uh, broad energy, energy range. These are examples of uh, models applied to another AGN, FADAL-9, coming from data of the Suzaku satellite and the XMM-Newton satellite, which are sensitive essentially below, only below 10 kV. And these models, they describe uh, equally well, from the statistical point of view, the same data set, but unfortunately they correspond to completely different values of the black hole spin. And they are different uh, depending on which is the assumption on the, of the uh, soft excesses. So they are different to in things which are in principle completely unrelated to the physics of the accretion field, probably. But you immediately see when you have two models equally well describing the same data and corresponding to completely different values of the spin, even if your statistical error on the measure of the spin is very low, your systematic uncertainties on the determination of the spin is huge. And there are many cases where the, when this happens, the different model of the same data sets, equally statistically good, correspond to different values of the spin. Uh, there are also nasty degeneracy in the parameters that we use uh, to describe uh, or to model the X-ray spectra. Uh, this is probably one of the nastiest, that there is a correlation between the measurement of the black hole spin and the uh, uh, ion abundance that we use uh, in uh, fitting the data. And uh, the reason is uh, due to the fact that this broad profile of the iron line, that they are located, obviously, for obvious uh, reason related to the atomic physics, they are very close to the absorption edge, the photoelectric absorption edge of iron, and uh, the depth of the absorption edges is primarily determined by the column density and the uh, metallicity of the, of the material responsible for absorption and reflection. So depending on which is the metallicity that you're assuming, the depth of your edge in the model is larger or smaller, and if it is larger, the model requires to compensate the deeper photoelectric absorption edge with stronger relativistic effects. So there is a sort of intrinsic degeneracy, which once again is due to two facts. One is the astrophysics, that we don't know which is the metallicity uh, in the environment of this AGN. We have no independent way of measuring this metallicity. And secondly, it is related to the poor energy resolution of our CCD cameras, which mix in an intrinsic way uh, phenomena which occurs as slightly different energies. 
Finally, I would like to show you a lineal plot on how our currently uncertainties on instrumental calibration also affect in X-ray astronomy the measurement of the spin. Now, this is a plot where I put on the plane, uh, on the x-axis, the disinclination angle, and on the y-axis, the black hole spin, as a measure that we buy from data. So, fitting uh, uh, state-of-the-art data with state-of-the-art models. Very well. And uh, these data points are in pairs, and the pairs are connected by lines. And uh, the pairs represent the measurements that I obtain if I vary the calibration of each instrument within our current systematic uncertainties on the calibration of the transfer function of the instrument. Is it clear what to do? So I know I calibrate an instrument. This instrument is nominally calibrated, but the calibration has some uncertainties. So what I do, I vary the calibration of the instruments in order to take into account of these systematic calibration uncertainties. And for each of these corresponding transfer function, I calculate the uh, measured on the same data, black hole spin and this information. And I show you how these parameters vary. So in some cases, calibration uncertainties play no role. I got always the same results, notwithstanding which the, the, what it, well, notwithstanding the true value of the calibration of my instrument is. But in some cases, I get extremely large differences depending on which calibration I use. So these are the problems, solutions. One solution is better modeling. I'm not entitled or able to talk about these kind of things. There will be probably some discussion about the current status of modeling in Michel talk, where you talk about reverberation. But we need some better modeling in order to describe uh, the data. What I mean better modeling, I mean modeling which can be used by observer in their spectral fitting programs. Uh, we need, unfortunately, more and more subtle calibration work in order to reduce uh, the systematic uncertainties of a calibration of X-ray detector to a lower where these uncertainties do not have an impact on the astrophysics. Now, this is an extremely boring topic, of course, on which I'm not going to tell anything, although it's my daily bread. But there are a couple of references for those of you who are really interested to understand where the problem is. Uh, we need the broadband measurements at high resolution, and this will be my two slides of my talk. We would need X-ray polarization, but unfortunately there is no X-ray polarization mission approved so far, so this is just <coughs> hope for the future. And variability can help, and there is a large uh, other topic uh, in, this, uh, in this sense, which is uh, very recently emerged uh, in uh, observational X-ray astronomy, which are the measurements of reverberation time lags, which can be related to the reflection of the primary continuum to the accretion disk. Of course, I don't have time to enter in any detail on this, so I just refer to a recent review published by Atlee collaborator recently. So let me just show two slides on the Broadman measurements. You, I show you this plot. This plot, we remember you. Two models correspond to completely different values of the black hole spin, which fit equally very well data up to 10 k. Now, the good news is that if we can extend these models above 10 k, the models are completely different. So we can discriminate between which one of the two models is correct and reduce uh, these uh, systematic degeneracy, these systematic uncertainty. And fortunately, now we have an instrument which allows us to deliver broadband spectra of quality sufficient for this purpose, which is NUSTAR. And this is a one, probably the first scientific results published by NUSTAR ever. NUSTAR is an American mission operational since 2012. And essentially, what the data extending now up to 7 kV allow you to do is to tell which of these two competing models is the correct one, and therefore to determine the spin with unprecedented accuracy. And in this case, the spin could be constrained to be higher than 0 0.96. So in this case, we have now a very robust measurement of a maximal spin in black hole, thanks to the extended broadband. In the future, with Astro H, so the mission which is, uh, going to, which is paying in this moment my salary, this Japanese mission, we will have not only, like I show in these uh, simulated spectra, Astro H will be launched next year, so we don't have data yet of Astro H. These are simulated spectra of the MCG 63015. Not only we, we, we will have a broadband spectrum covering up to 100 kV, and I've just showed you that this helps. 
But in addition to that, we will have high resolution, a microcalorimeter instrument with a resolution of the order of few hundred in the 6 kV band, which is exactly the band where the iron line, probably uh, distorted by relativistic effects, is located. So once with this instrument is in orbit, we will have the ultimate tool in order to reduce most of the degeneracy which are related to uncertainties on uh, spectral fittings on data. And uh, with this, I'm glad to answer any questions. Thank you.